So we said suppose uh, f is continuous on a closed bounded interval and differentiable on the interior. And then there's this interesting requirement right here. F of, f of a is equal to f of b. What is that saying? Yeah, the y values at the endpoints here have to be the same. Now, there's not a lot of functions that behave that way. I'm thinking of a function that maybe, you know, goes up and then comes down and that's at the same height there or something like that. Okay, that's what we're saying here for Rolls' theorem. That's a very strong restriction. Uh, and so it, it's uh, only, only a few functions will actually will that apply to. But uh, we'll see that we can actually tweak this result when it comes to the mean value theorem. Okay. So here's the result of Rolls' theorem. Suppose you've met this condition, this condition, and this condition. Then, and this is what's called an existence theorem. There exists a C contained in that open interval so that f prime of c is equal to 0. So we're, we're saying that if you meet these three conditions, you are guaranteed to find at least one c value on the interior where what? Yeah, I heard a lot of good things where, the, where you've got a horizontal tangent line where the derivative is zero, where the instantaneous rate of change is temporarily zero. Okay? Um, so here I give uh, a little statement about Rolls' theorem. I think that it connects two intuitive notions regarding the two intuitive notions regarding continuity and horizontal tangent lines. So suppose an object begins and ends in the same spot. I'm thinking of throwing a ball up in the air and you catch it. Okay? If that happens, what are you guaranteed? You throw a ball up in the air, it returns to you. Rolls' theorem says you are guaranteed to find a place where that ball was temporarily motionless. Right? And that, that fits with our understanding of the physical world. Right? And the reason why is because the, the motion that we experience in the physical world is both continuous and, in a lot of cases, differentiable. Okay? There aren't sharp changes that are so abrupt we can't measure them with the derivative very often in the real world. Okay? So that's a sort of intuitive understanding of Rolls' theorem. Just for fun, you can try it yourself. So connect any function you like here and try to do it where you don't have a horizontal tangent line. So fill it in, try to, try to connect the dots, see what you can do. Ooh, good, great question. What was that? I just make an absolute value. Ah. Very good. So Coyle, Coyle said, hey, what about this? That's continuous. It started into the same point. It doesn't have a horizontal tangent line. Does that con contradict Rolls' theorem? I hope not. If Rolls' theorem is broken, then all of calculus is broken. <laughs> I'm out of a job. You get to go home, and there's no more math. <laughs> so I hope not. What, why doesn't this contradict Rolls' theorem? James. Ah, we added that it had to be differentiable on the interior, meaning the derivative had to exist everywhere on the interior. So that's a good, you're thinking of the right sorts of counterexamples to these. But it turns out, nope, it's, <laughs> it's pretty robust. It'll hold, it'll hold your, under your scrutiny. Okay? So yeah, so this one, this one, rolls doesn't apply. Okay? But you could try something, I don't know, go up and down and up and down. Look at that. There are three places where we have horizontal tangent lines. That doesn't contradict Rolls' theorem. Rolls' theorem said there's at least one place. Okay? Let's be very clear about Rolls' theorem's prediction. It's saying that there exists a what value? A C value. So I'm referring to something like this right here. That's C1. Because why? What would be F prime of C1? The derivative, the slope of the tangent line at that point would be 0. And Rolls' of Serum says there is no way to get from this point to this point without having a horizontal tangent line. Try it. Okay. Please, if you find it, class is over. <laughs> All right. So let's try to prove, prove Rolls' theorem here. Okay. What we're going to do, and I'm going to run through this a little bit quick, because uh, it's really just a means to an end. We're trying to get to the, uh, 
the mean value theorem. Uh, so we're, we're going to look at three cases. Case one, f could be a constant function. Well, if f is a constant function, what's its derivative? Zero. Zero. And let me be clear. Um, I'm writing f prime of x is equal to 0 on the entire interval from a to b. So everyone pay attention to what I didn't put f of x naught or f of d or f of some value is equal to 0. It is the derivative is, math people would say, it's identically equal to 0. No matter what you pick for x, it's going to output a 0. Okay? So it's identically equal to 0. Not that there's some point where the derivative is 0. But if that's true, then any c contained in a, b satisfies Rolle's theorem. Right? Because if the derivative is identically 0, pick any number in that interval and plug it into the function. and What's the derivative going to be there? Zero. Zero. We found it, right? That's not a very interesting case, right? <laughs> I mean, big deal. The, the constant function is derivative of zero, right? But what that enables us to do now is now we put a dividing line down the center, and we get to break it up into two additional cases. So the second case is, let's say, uh, so case two, there exists. Uh, um, an x star or an x naught contained in a, b so that f of x naught is greater than f of a. Okay. So my last, the second two cases are, I'm, I'm breaking up into two other possibilities. Either it's a constant function or there's at least one instance where the function rises above its initial value. Or there's at least one instance, and that'll be case three, where it drops below its initial value. Okay, so it's kind of an exercise in logic. Either it's constant, or if it's not constant, what has it got to do? At some point it's got to rise, or at some point it's got to fall, right? Okay. By the way, um, I'm just, I just need that much. That's enough to say what I want to say, but notice that would also mean that f of x naught is greater than f of b, how come? Yeah, the, the assumption of Rolle's theorem is that f of a and f of b are the same. Okay? But it's enough for me to just find, I just need to say that at some point we're higher than where we started. Okay? So, we know that f has a global maximum. How do we know that f has a global maximum? Oh. What's that? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so I'm claiming that we know that f has a global maximum. How do we know that? Because it's on a um, defined interval and it's continuous. Or a closed interval. Or a closed interval and it's. Um, yeah. So, that was, so there was something we had in section 4.1. Okay, check out the video. Okay. Uh, where I ran through that, something called the extreme value theorem. The extreme value theorem says that every continuous function ha achieves its global maximum and global minimum on a closed bounded interval. Well, what did we start off with? We started off saying f is continuous on a closed bounded interval. Right? So we know it has to achieve its global maximum. Okay? We know by the extreme value theorem that f must achieve its maximum. Where can that maximum no longer be? Who said that? Was that? Somebody said it? Yeah. So sometimes maximums can occur at the endpoints, right? But in case two, I said we found a value that's higher than the endpoints. So can the maximum occur at the endpoints in case two? No. 
So where does it have to occur? It has to happen by the extreme value theorem. So where does it have to happen? Not at the endpoints, but on the, on the interior, right? So must achieve its maximum, and so it must be on the interior. Okay. Again, because we, we said in this case, we're saying it rises. If it rises above where it starts and it returns to where it starts, the maximum has to be somewhere in the middle. Okay. So it is also a what? A local maximum, right? Okay, if you don't know those words, oh, you gotta watch that video. There's an Easter egg in there, I think the phrase is. Two of you found it. Okay. All right. So it has a, uh, yeah, only two of you. <laughs> it's a bummer. Uh, so it has a local maximum. Okay. Um, well, what now? Well, last, in that section, uh, we introduced something called Fermat's theorem. Let's see where. Extreme value theorem. There we go. So we introduced something called Fermat's theorem. Nope. Sorry. Here we go. Fermat's theorem that says if you have a local maximum or minimum at some value c and the derivative exists, what does the derivative have to be? The derivative has to be zero. <coughs> well, look what we've just said. We've just said that we've got a local maximum. We've just said that f is differentiable on the interior, which means the derivative exists everywhere on the interior. So by Fermat's theorem, or Fermat, there exists, just a symbol for there exists, but let me write it out. There exists a c. So that f prime of c equals 0. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to do case 3. Case 3 is the same as case 2, except what? Instead of assuming that there's some place where it rises, we assume that there's some place that it declines. And then by the extreme value theorem, we know it has to have a global minimum. And since it can't be at the endpoints, the global minimum must be on the interior, interior so it must be a local minimum, and then at that point you've satisfied all the conditions for Fermat's theorem. And so then you also get it. Okay? So case three, I'll just write out what it is, but we won't actually do it. We'll say, uh, suppose there's an x naught so that f of x naught is less than f of a. And then you basically repeat case two, except using the words minimum instead of maximum. Oh, yeah. I'll, uh, so I've run out of letters, right? We've got A, B, and C. So I could have used D. Uh, but I don't want you to think that there's any sort of ordering to this. So I just, it just stands for a fixed value, um, an unspecified but fixed value. So oftentimes we label that and we start numbering it. And the first one we number in math is 0. In math, we often start counting with 0. I don't know why. Okay. Um, but yeah, so it just stands for a fixed number that we haven't specified. I don't want to use x because x stands for a variable. So I use x not to stand for a specific x value. Okay. Yeah. OK. Um, number five is an interesting result, but uh, uh, I'm going to skip it. Okay. Um, maybe I'll go back and put it in, uh, in a video later. It's not something I'm going to hold you responsible for. Uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting result, but we just need to get caught up. Um, and I want to make sure we have sort of an extra long review tonight. Da, 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 the mean value theorem, right? Here it is. One of the big four results from calculus, OK? Uh, mean here is, is maybe how you feel about it, but it, but it refers to average, 
Okay, this is the let's think of this. The word mean uh, in math also means average. Okay, so this is the average value, but we call it the mean value theorem. Okay, so it says suppose f is continuous on a b and differentiable on the interior, then there exists a c such that something happens, and I'm going to state that in just a second. This is one of the few theorems in this class that I will ask you to regurgitate. Okay? Sort of like the epsilon de delta definition of the derivative. Okay? Except I won't do it multiple choice. I'll just say what is the mean value theorem. Okay? So just write this on a card, exactly this. And when I ask that question, you get three points. Okay? So the mean value theorem says that there exists a C so that f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. Did that change your life? I don't know. No, not just the equation. So I want you to know the equation. You need to know it. But you also need to know the conditions which, which need to be satisfied for this to hold. Right? Yeah, so that would be, I mean, it's basically this entire statement here. What's that? Where? Where? <laughs> All right. Let's start parsing this out a little bit. What is this piece right here? Kevin? Slope it's a slope formula. Specifically, it's a slope formula for the line that connects what in this question, in this problem? Endpoint to a, endpoint, right? The A to B, right? This is the, this is the endpoint for which we're considering. Okay. So what's another way to interpret slope? The average rate of change. So the average rate of change connecting A to B uh, of the line, so, so the average rate of change between A and B, or the slope of the line connecting A and B, is equal to what? How do we interpret the derivative? What's that? I heard it. It's the instantaneous rate of change. Okay. Instantaneous rate of change evaluated at some number. Okay. So this is the average rate of change over the interval. And what is this? This is the instant, let me make that a little nicer. This is the instantaneous rate of change at a point. The mean value theorem guarantees that there is a place where the instantaneous rate of change is equivalent to the average rate of change. Now, you may not be too excited about that result. That's perfectly fine. You have to know it. I would argue that one of the reasons why it's not a very exciting result is because it describes something we all intuitively have realized through our life. Okay? What this says is that there is a, so, so let's go ahead and look at this uh, physical We'll keep talking about it here in just a second, but let's look at number eight. A physical demonstration of this is that, let's say your average rate of change, let's say you've got a car that's averaging 50 miles per hour over, you know, between t equals zero and t equals five, it averaged 50 miles per hour. Then the mean value theorem guarantees what? There must have been at least one point in time where you were traveling what? exactly 50 miles an hour. There must have been one point in time where your instantaneous rate of change was 50 miles per hour. Okay. And that's, that sort of connects together this notion of a rate of change, instantaneous rate of change, and continuity. It puts the two together. It says there's no way for you to go from z zero uh, to average 50 miles per hour if you know, you started out going zero and then you're going 60. At some point, you, if your average was 50, you had to actually travel 50 miles per hour. Okay? Now, we all understand that because that's how the world works. Because motion that we, that we perceive is usually continuous. Okay? 
By the way, um, for those of you who have done physics, uh, th that issue of continuity, I, I think I've come up with a kind of interesting way to talk about what's, some, what's called the wave-particle duality. Have you guys heard this in physics? Uh, it doesn't. If, if you haven't heard it before, uh, it's, it's a statement that, way, that light sometimes acts like a wave and sometimes it acts, acts like a particle. To me, from a math standpoint, that's saying sometimes the motion of light is continuous and sometimes the motion of light is discrete. Okay. Anyway, that's, that's kind of where these physical ideas get represented in mathematics. All right. Uh, so again, an interpretation of this is that there is a place where the, and here I'm just because it's up there, but the instantaneous rate of change matches the average rate of change. Okay. So, I want to do the proof of this. Like I said, I'm not going to ask you to do this proof, but there are some aspects from it that I might hold you, you know, ask, expect you to recognize and say some true-false questions or something like that. Okay. So here's our general strategy. Okay. I, we just did a proof of an existence theorem, Rolls's theorem, which guaranteed the existence of a certain C value when you've met certain conditions. Well, there's no coincidence that we covered that right before now. Okay. So I'd like to somehow use Rolls's theorem. But what's the issue? Can I use Rolls' theorem just based on what I've said here? Have we met all the conditions of Rolls' theorem? No. James, what do you say? Uh, uh, yeah, to use Rolls' theorem, I have to have the two endpoints be the same. And that's not necessarily the case for, it might be, but it's not necessarily the case for any get, for, the, for just pick a random function f. Okay? So what I'd like to do is let's come up with a new function somehow based upon f that sort of gets us at the same result. Okay? So that's what we're going to do with our mean value theorem proof. Okay? So what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to define some new function h which gives, let's see, h of x gives the distance between uh, f of x and its secant line between a and b. Okay. So let's look at that. Let's say I've got, uh, here's a, so this would be f of a. And maybe over here I've got b, and up here I've got f of b. Okay. And I've got some function f that maybe does something, who knows, oops, that's a little, uh, that's not quite a function. Maybe it does something like this, like that. Okay. So its secant line, its secant line would be something like, oh, let me make it solid. Its secant line would be this, right? So I don't know who came up with this. I think it's a really clever proof. What I'd like to do is create a new function h, which measures this distance right there. Okay. I'm going to make that same thing, but I'm just going to make it thinner. So this number right here would be h of x, if this were some value down here value x. So what, is, what does h do? It measures this distance between the red line, the function, and the blue line, the secant line. Okay. I don't think it's entirely clear why we want this function h just yet. Okay. So what would be h of x? Well, h of x then would equal f of x. That's the, that's the value. In fact, let me color code that. It would equal uh, f of x minus 
the equation of this blue line. What's the equation of this blue line? Well, it's a secant line, right? So it's got a slope. Its slope would be f of b minus f of a all over b minus a times x minus some x1 value. Let's pick a. And then plus f of a. I better put parentheses around all that. Don't let your eyes glaze over, folks. That's just a line. <laughs> should, we, should we go through that? Yeah, let's go through that, OK? <laughs> Based on the reaction, let's go through it. Okay. So if I want to describe, here's, here's, uh, here's the order pair a comma f of a, and here's the order pair uh, b comma f of b. Who knows what the function's doing? Function can be doing whatever it wants. But if I want to find the equation of that blue line right there, I'm going to use my point slope form of the line, right? So it's going to be y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1, right? Everyone OK with that? Stop me if you get lost. Okay. So I'd like to pick this as my, we'll pick this as the x1 and the f of x1. So what is this going to be? It's going to be y minus f of a is equal to the slope of the line times x minus a, right? Everyone okay with that? Just, just follow in this formula? Okay. Now we need the slope. Well, the slope is f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. Right? So if I solve this for y, what do I get? I get y equals f of b minus f of a all over b minus a times x minus a. And then I add that f of a over, right? So this, oops, this is that expression right there. If I lost you on that fact, don't worry. Trust, just, uh, trust me that that's the equation of this blue line. Okay. okay. Why on earth did I want to come up with this function h? So you can find the distance between the line and the well, that's, Yeah, that's what h measures. And what's one way that might be beneficial? Kimberly says we can use Rolls's theorem. That's I mean, yeah, that's our hope, right? How does Rolls's theorem apply? Because now you have the flavor of a, or you could say. So so yeah, what is what is h of a? So h measures the distance between the red line and the blue line. When I go over to the value where x is a, what is the what is the size of h? It's zero. Okay. What about as I go over to b? What is the size of h? It's 0. So that means that h of a is equal to h of b. Okay? Let's just, let's just note that. Oops. Uh, what is h of a? Well, let's see here. If I plug in an a for x here, right? And I would plug in, an, I'm just going to do this by, by pointing on the board. If I plug in, uh, if I plug in an a for x here and an a for x here, well, first of all, an A here would give me what? Zero. zero. Zero times this whole thing. So the only parts that are left are this f of x and this f of a. But what am I plugging plug in for x here? A. So I've got f of a minus f of a. So what is h of a? It's zero. OK. That may or may not be useful. Let's find out what h of b is. Okay. When I plug in a b here, this one's a little bit harder to see. I'd have an f of b, right? I'd have a b minus a right here. Okay, let me set this down. I think I've got it. I've got a b minus a right here. This b minus a will cancel with this b minus a, right? Leaving me with f of b minus f of b plus f of a minus f of a, taking me all the way down to zero. 
Folks, this is a fun little proof. Some of you are enjoying it. I appreciate that. Okay. But it's one I think everyone can track with. Okay. If not, you'll watch the video on it and think about it a little more. Okay, because I think we've all got the tools for this. Okay. All right. So what does Rolls' theorem now guarantee? So let's see here. Uh, actually, let's go ahead and say two other things. So we've just shown that the two endpoints are the same. Let's just note that H, oops, <laughs> no, that's the whole point. H is continuous on AB. How come? How do I know that H is continuous on AB? secant line that showed up right here okay we can work with that what do we know about a line is a line continuous a line's continuous and then I'm adding just a value to it it's a constant continuous and the sum of two continuous functions is again continuous okay what about f of x is f continuous that was the condition of the theorem F is continuous. Okay, so we know that F is or H. Excuse me. We know that F is continuous, and so this expression involving a line F and a constant must also be continuous. Okay. We also know H is differentiable on what? On the interior, folks. I do expect you to pay attention to the difference between these two. Continuous is on a closed bounded interval. Why did I need continuous on a closed bounded interval? Because at some point I used the extreme value theorem. It's buried way deep. Okay. Where did we use the extreme value theorem? Well, we're about to call on Rolls' theorem, which relied on Fermat's theorem, which relied on the extreme value theorem. So it's buried pretty deep there. That's why I needed it on a closed bounded. And then so what are my intervals for differentiability? It's an open one. So pay attention to the difference between the two. Okay? Differentiability is always a, uh, a harder requirement, so it's always kind of, it, all, it often shows up on a smaller interval, because that's a harder requirement to meet. Okay? Plus, we haven't defined derivatives at endpoints, which is nice. Okay? All right, so all of this means Rolls' theorem applies. Rolls guarantees a C so that what? So that I agree that something's going to equal 0. Who's going to equal 0? Is it F prime of C that's going to equal 0? We just met all the conditions of Rolls' theorem based on which function? H. So that H prime of C equals 0. That's an H prime of C. Let me clean that up a little bit. Okay. So H prime of C equals 0. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and compute H prime of X. Okay. And out of room here. Uh, I'll compute h prime of x over here. Okay. Well, first of all, can I can, can I compute h prime of x? Sure. We said it was differentiable. Okay. So what would its derivative be? Well, I'm going to take the derivative term-wise, right? So h's derivative will be f prime of x. Okay. How about for this minus f of a term? What's its derivative going to be? What's the derivative of this term going to be? No? It's a constant, right? It's a constant, right? F of A is a constant. Careful where your x's are or where your a's are. This is just a number, right? What's the derivative of just a constant? Zero. Zero. So that term's going to vanish. Okay? What is this expression right here? It's a line. What is the derivative of a line? It is a constant. What constant? No? No? 
There's a line, right? What's the derivative of its line? Yes, I agree that the derivative of this line is a constant, but it's not just any constant. What constant is it? It is the slope of the line, right? So what's the slope of this line right here? It's this expression right here. Just tell me you agree. It's this expression right here. Yes? Okay. Right, because this is the mx portion. And when I take its derivative, I just get m. Okay. So we get minus f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. But we know that h prime of c has to equal 0. So that tells us that 0 is equal to f prime of x minus f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. Oh, we're within epsilon of being done with this proof. What do I do next? We're trying to sit. There's the instantaneous. Oops, oops. Folks, I made a little mistake here. Actually, a serious one. That's f prime of what? f prime of c, because we're finding h prime of c. So everywhere I saw, saw an x in the derivative expression, I plugged in a c. So this tells us that f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. And that is the result that we were looking for, that the instantaneous was equal to the average. I don't know who came up with that. It's a clever, clever series of proofs. OK, next page. OK, uh, let's convince ourselves that the mean, mean value theorem holds. No matter how you try to get from here to here, that's too many. I can't draw that many. No matter how you try to get from here to there, what is the mean value theorem saying? It's saying there is a place where the what equals the what? Yeah. So what's my average rate of change? It's that blue line, right? Now, the mean value theorem says there is a place where the derivative returns that same slope number. Do you see where that might apply? I think right here might be my c value. How come? Because if I go up there and I put a tangent line, what is the slope of that tangent line? It is the slope, it is the same as the slope of the secant line. And there's actually maybe, we'll call that one C1, because I think there's maybe a second one right here. Boy, that's, oh, that's pretty ugly. Let's try that again. Yeah. Okay. In this case, we found two. Does that violate the mean value theorem? No, the mean value theorem is an existence theorem. It says there is one where that happens. Okay. There's nothing wrong with there being more than one. Okay, if the function's a little less exciting, maybe something like this. Is there a place where the instantaneous rate of change equals the average? I think so. Go ahead and put it on there. Where you think it goes. Let's maybe do something like that. Who knows? OK, so label your C's on here. Make sure you understand what we're saying. I think the C value may be, I don't know, maybe right about there. Would that be the C value? Let's see. Let's put a tangent line on it. Yeah. It looks like the tangent line matches the slope of the secant line. Now, what is the mean value theorem saying? It's not telling me where that C value is. It is simply guaranteeing that you can always find one of those C values. So math people call the mean value theorem an existence theorem. It guarantees that something exists. 
leaves it on you to go find it. Okay. But again, we've sort of I think I've said this once before in this class that before you go looking for a needle in a haystack, it's really nice to know that the needle's in the haystack. Okay, let's put this into action. So, um, number 11 and number 12, these are the typical types of ways we test people on whether they get the mean value theorem. Okay. So we say find the C value predicted by the mean value theorem. Okay. Before I do that, let's at least pay lip service to the conditions of the mean value theorem. What were the conditions? F is continuous on the interval 0 to 2. Is that true? Yes, it looks like it. Yes. The graph looks like it, and, and indeed it is a polynomial function, and polynomial functions are continuous everywhere. So specifically, they're continuous on 0, 2. f is differentiable everywhere. So specifically, it's differentiable on the interior, 0, 2. So we have satisfied the conditions of the mean value theorem. So this is a little bit hard, folks. What am I asking you to do here? Find the C value predicted in the mean value theorem. Okay, let's go ahead and just state the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem would say that f prime of some unknown C is equal to f of 2 minus f of 0 all over 2 minus 0. Right? What is on the left-hand side? The instantaneous rate of change at some point. Don't forget to add at some point. What is on the right-hand side? <coughs> yeah, or the average rate of change. Okay. So, what is f? So before we could actually do this, we need to find two things. I need to first calculate f prime, and I need to calculate the average rate of change. And you do those two as sort of separate calculations, and then you put them together. And what happens is, unfortunately, students only ever do one of those two calculations, and then they don't know what to do beyond that. Okay? Usually about 30% mm, about, about of the class misses this question. Okay. So let's take the derivative. What's the derivative of this function? 3x squared minus 1. 3x squared minus 1. We found, the we found, we found a formula for the instantaneous rate of change. Okay? Then let's find the average rate of change. Well, that would be f of 2 minus f of 0 all over 2 minus 0, which is equal to 6 minus 0 over 2 minus 0, which is equal to 3. So I found a formula for the instantaneous rate of change. I found the average rate of change. Now what am I going to do? Going to make each other. That's that's the that's the step that most people miss. You find the instantaneous rate of change, you find the average rate of change. The mean value theorem says there's a place where they're equal. So set them equal to each other and then solve. Okay? So this is the key step that most people miss with this problem. You're going to set uh, 3x squared minus 1 equal to 3. What did I just do? I set the formula for the instantaneous equal to the average. You could have done all of this without knowing the mean value theorem. Where does the mean value theorem come into play? What am I about to do? I'm about to solve an equation. Do every, does every equation have a solution? Hopefully you've seen plenty of equations that don't have solutions. Does this equation have a solution? Oh, I guarantee it. How come? The mean value theorem guarantees that this will have a solution. Does that make sense? So a lot of times you go to try to find an answer, and that answer may or may not be there. But I am absolutely certain that this equation right here has a solution that shows up in this interval. How come I know that? Because we've met all the conditions for the mean value theorem. Okay. So here we go. So I'm not scared solving this one bit. I'm certain that this thing has a solution. 
we get 3x squared equals 4. We get x squared equals 4 thirds. We get x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 4 thirds, or x is equal to plus or minus uh, 2 over radical 3. This, do this equation have solutions? That should be radical 3. Did this equation have solutions? Yes, in fact, it had two. That's more than we were hoping for. At least one of them showed up where? Inside the interval between 0 and 2, namely the positive one. Okay. So our c value is c equals 2 divided by the square root of 3. So where did the mean value theorem come into play? It came into play right here when I went to go solve this equation. I knew that this equation would have a solution. Do all quadratics have solutions in the reals? No, sometimes they've got imaginary solutions. But I wasn't scared, because okay, we'd, we'd met the conditions for the mean value theorem. I mean, but we could all, I mean, given any function, we can always compute the average rate of change on an interval. Mm -hmm. And given a lot of functions, we can always calculate the instantaneous rate of change. And we could always, if we wanted to, set them equal to each other. But that, there, there's nothing, without the mean value theorem, there's nothing that would guarantee that would have a solution. Gotcha. But the mean value theorem does guarantee it has a solution. Yeah. Okay, so let's, I mean, here's the picture of this function, folks. Okay, so just it's nice to have a picture to go with it. What was the slope of this line? The slope of this line was 3. What did we do? We found a c value, 2 over the square root of 3. What's that? Oh, that's approximately 1.15. Okay, so maybe right about here. We found a c value where when I drew the slope of the tangent line right there, that's pretty bad. There's my c value. What's the slope of this green line? It is also equal to 3. Okay. All right, so I'd like you to all try number 12 on your own, or in your groups. Try number 12. Folks, what have we done so far? We've said that f is continuous on 1, 4. You don't have to write the first line that I did, but that's the justification. If it's, if it's continuous on 0 to infinity, then it's also got to be continuous on 1, 4. And if it's differentiable on 0 to infinity, then it's also got to be differentiable on 1, 4. You could just say these, really, the, the, the only important lines are the second, the second lines. Those are the things to say. Please do pay lip service to that, right? Because not all functions adhere to the mean value theorem. Namely, the ones that aren't continuous or aren't differentiable, where they're supposed to be. Okay. okay. So then what did I do? What did I do over here? 
found the derivative, which gives me a formula for the instantaneous rate of change, right? And then what did I do? Computed the average rate of change. Okay. Folks, you should be comfortable just looking at a natural log of four. It's an ugly number, but don't tell it that, right? Don't stare. <laughs> okay? It's just the natural log of four, and that's well, that you just leave it at that. Okay? All right. This is the critical step. A lot of students can get to here. What is my next step? We're going to set the instantaneous rate of change formula equal to the average rate of change. So this is the key step. We're going to set uh, f prime of x equal to the natural log of 4 over 3. Okay. So we get 1 over x is equal to the natural log of 4 over 3. Boy, I haven't solved a lot of equations with logarithms, but as I recall from college algebra, that sometimes they don't have solutions. Will this one have a solution? Yes. I don't know. Yes. It's guaranteed, bro. <laughs> It's guaranteed by the mean value theorem. I was reserving judgment. <laughs> okay. So, so let's go ahead and do it. Let's multiply both sides by 3x. Okay. If we multiply both sides by 3x, we get 3 is equal to x times the natural log of 4, or that x is equal to 3 over the natural log of 4. That is the value predicted by the mean value theorem. I should probably, um, it doesn't really matter, but let me label it as c. c equals three over the natural log of four. There it is. We found the C value where the instantaneous rate of change there would be uh, the natural log of four over three, the same as the average rate of change. All right. Um, this would be a fun one. To, oh, I didn't say this, folks. For this, you go on to more math classes. If ever the instructor asks a question and the class is dead silent, a good, a good guess at the answer is the mean value theorem. Just, just telling you. Okay? If nobody seems to know what the answer is, just say the mean, I think, it, just don't say it is, just say, could it be the mean value theorem? And, and four times out of five, you're right. Okay? So, so in fact, I, I'm not going to prove this one for you, but what would I use to prove this theorem? Well, you're right. <laughs> you would use the mean value theorem to prove this. Okay, but let's go ahead and see. I think you all actually already knew this answer. Okay. It says that if the derivative is always 0, then what function did that come from? Sure, continuous function, but we can say more than that, be more specific. Yeah. Okay. So we all already knew what, is, what was the derivative of a constant function? Zero. But we could take a step beyond that. If the derivative is always zero, then the function must have been a constant function. So saying it the other way works as well. We knew that f prime of a constant was always zero, but if f prime is always zero, then it must have come from f must have been a constant function. Okay? So that's what this is saying. Okay? And I think you've all already observed that. Okay? But there is no crazy function out there that's not constant whose derivative is always 0. Okay? So we could prove that using the mean value theorem, but we're not going to. Okay? Here's a big result. Okay? So again, this, this is a huge result in the second half of this course for, that we will need for the second half of this course. Um, and it relies upon the mean value theorem. Okay? It says that suppose two functions have the same what? If two functions have the same derivative, then they must have started out being pretty close to one another. How close? The most they could have differed, well, their difference would have to be a constant. And if that's the case, then the most the two functions could differ by is a constant. And I think you recognize this, so I'm not going to prove this. We're just out of time. You'd use, you'd use the theorem at the bottom of the last page, which relied upon the mean value theorem. Okay. But let's just make some observations. If I gave you the function f of x is equal to x squared plus 27, what's its derivative? Its derivative is 2x. 
And if I gave you the function g of x is equal to x squared minus uh, pi, what's its derivative? 2x. Okay. So these two functions have the same derivative. How much could they differ by? Just by a constant. That's what that's saying there. Okay. So in fact, if I tell you that h, of, h prime of x is equal to 2x, you tell me something about h. What can you tell me about h? If h's derivative is 2x, what could you tell me about h? It's got to be x squared plus 20 plus 50 minus 87 plus some sort of constant. You can tell me a little bit about it. Not completely, okay? And we've seen that before, right? You lose some information when you take a derivative. Okay, we've said before the derivative can't tell you exactly how high you are on the y-axis. It just tells you how you're behaving, whether you're going uphill or downhill. It doesn't say what your current elevation is. That's reflected in this idea here. If I give you the derivative, you know that it came from the function x squared, but you don't know if it was x squared plus 50 or x squared minus 7. We're going to need this result when we do what are called antiderivatives. In fact, let's, let's give a name to it now. Okay, this is actually for another section. But this is called finding antiderivatives, undoing a derivative. Okay. So let's find the function, or actually let's say it like this. Let's find the family of functions whose derivative is this expression here. So I'd like everyone to try it. Okay. Take your time, think about it. You've seen each one of these expressions show up as a derivative before. What function would provide that derivative? Was that? Well, I, so I want you to give it as a family of functions. But you're right. Most of them are all going to look, well, they all look pretty similar to each other. They'll all be the same up to a what? Up to the constant. So this is the derivative when we're trying to take it back a step. This, yes. I want you to give me a function, in fact, a whole family of functions, that when you take its derivative, this is what you get. Yep. All right, so let's, let's give this function right here. x cubed plus 5x squared plus 7x plus 30 minus 70 plus 50 plus some arbitrary constant c. That is the family of functions that when, you take, that when you take its derivative, it collapses down to this derivative here. They all give this as its derivative. Okay. Any questions on that, folks? We will learn, in fact, a large portion of the second half of calculus is learning techniques for doing derivatives backwards. It's easier said than done. Okay. All right.